Uh, we're going to be in Psalms 139, if you want to go ahead and turn over there. Uh, we're going to take a look at David's life. Um, most of you know, if you've read much on David, he is always at war. He's always running. This is God's chosen king for his people. He wasn't appointed. God appointed him for his people people but all the struggles and sacrifices that he had to make along the way the sum right here pretty much sums it up at the nearness of God how much he needed God or he realized he couldn't do without God once God had blessed him and all the troubles that he had went through and he's always consulting with God and the man of God on God's behalf but this psalm right here pretty much sums up who God is and who God is in each and every one of our lives. If we know God, truly know God, and we know that he showed up when we needed him or even when we didn't need him, he showed up for me last night, actually today, just on one little prayer that I needed him to take care of something and then I got a text later on, problem solved. At the moment, problem was solved right then. That's who David is looking at here in Psalm 139. You'll see that the different things he's going through, but he understands who God is. He understands the nearness of God. He understands the power of God. He understands God's glory. He understands he don't have to worry about God not being there, whether how he feels, how we feel, no matter what. If you're a child of God today, God said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And God can't lie. God don't sin. When God says something, it's settled. He never changes. He's forever and ever the same. We'll go through and read here a little bit. I want to talk about the attributes of God as, as it shows in the Psalms here. And I've got a, a little presentation book over here with the different attributes. And there's all kinds of attributes of God, but they nail a few down in here. And the main one being here is God, our refuge. Yeah, we can have a safe place no matter where we are, what's going on in our life, what kind of troubles we're having. And David shows you in Psalm 139 here, he's always there, no matter what. No matter if fear sets in, trouble sets in, what's going on around us, God said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And he keeps his promises. The tender warrior in David David Jeremiah's got a series going. I don't know if y'all have serious radio or y'all listen to David Jeremiah, but he's got a series going right now that he, he's been given the tender warrior, and he's, he's going through the life of David. And, but I love, I love hearing those stories about David, and especially with him speaking. Some people have a speaker's voice, and it just nails it home, everything, and they know how to talk, and they know, I don't know all the big words, but they just know what they're talking about. They, they can present the message over, but it just gets me pumped up. And uh, Paul said, I forget where it's at over there. He said, I, uh, it's First Timothy. He said, I come to stir you up. And that's what we're supposed to be doing with each other each and every day, especially whoever's standing behind this pulpit or leading a Sunday school class or teaching a Bible study. We're, we're to encourage one another and that's what David is doing here he's in uh, even over in Samuel I think it is when David encouraged himself in the Lord and that's where we're supposed to be today and I've been encouraged by doing this study I used to do Sunday school lessons for three or four years and and things happened in the church and then I'm out but I'm not going to say any bad thing about the church really it was probably mostly me not liking the way things were going but I learned more through Bible study 
in Sunday school and God kind of forcing me to read because I get bored just reading. Now, I don't get bored when God gives me instruction in the Bible. As a matter of fact, I, I hated reading when I was in high school. It bored me silly, but that was me. But God, he chose later on in life, a few years down the road, I started going to college out in the Northeast, and I had a speech class. Next thing I know, I'm standing up in a front in a room with a hundred people looking at me, and everybody was about ten years younger than I was. I didn't know how I was going to take it, but God seen fit to put me out there in front of people to get me ready for this. And I may not still be ready because it's been a few years, but God saw fit for me to do it, and I'm following the Lord. And Brother James asked me if I wanted to to teach tonight, and and of course. First thing I said was yes, because I know it's God's will for me to follow the Lord. But David here, we'll just go ahead and get off into it. <clears throat> Psalms 139. I think we're just going to go ahead and read all the, the 24 verses here, and then I'll, I'll go back and get off into some of the attributes and off into the lesson over here. Verse 1 says, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my sitting down and my, ri up, my uprising. Thou understandest my thoughts afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thy hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. Whether shall I go from thy spirit, or whether shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up to heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works. And my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret. And curious wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are, are thy thoughts unto me. O God, how great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more than the numbers of the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. Surely that will slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men. For they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies uh, take thy name in vain. Do not I hate them? O Lord, that hate thee, and am I not grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Verse 23 right there, he says, Search me, God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Because right there at the end of that chapter, you can see David is praising God all the way down through verse 18. He's praising God for him being there, his presence, his power, his knowledge. He's praising him. But when he gets to verse 19 there, he starts talking about the evil people. 
I'm trying to give a little setting where David is right now. I, I tried to search and see exactly where this psalm came from, what part of David's life was this in. And all I got out of it was there was a lot of evil around David at this time. A lot of evil men. You know, he was running for his life most of the time, especially when Saul, he ran from Saul, and he was all the time chasing after all of these different wars that, that God had sent him on and go do this and go do that. But anyway, there's a lot of evil people around him there, and that's where David, he's actually praying to God again. He's praying because he's got such a heart. David, a man of after God's own heart, he had such a heart for God that he's hating these men because they're cursing God. They're against God. Jesus said, if, he, if you're not for me, you're against me. And that's what David sees here. And their filthiness and mouths, and they're, just, they're cursing God. It says there, he takes, it, takes his name in vain. They're cursing at God. But that's the setting on that. But there in verse 21, he said, do not I hate them that hate me. It's not like the hate that we're talking about. He's talking about he rejects those kind of people, that hatred. That's what that. That's what he's talking about in that word there. Do not I hate them? Because most Christians know that we're not supposed to hate anybody. But you go back in those days, you might hate them people throwing swords at you and, and shooting arrows at you and trying to cut your head off. Yeah, you probably would hate them. Anyway, let's go further. Verse 1 through 6 down through there is showing the omniscience of God. David is saying, Thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my sitting downs and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. The omniscience is God's all knowing. That omni, omni, is actually, it's a Latin based prefix meaning all or complete. If you look at those words, he's omni, he's omniscient. He's omnipresent, and he's omnipotent. That omni means all. It means there's no in-between. It's from beginning to end. He said, I'm the first and the last. God is before everything and after everything and everything in between. There is no waiver on what this word omni means. Omniscient means all-knowing. It means to know everything. God's knowledge is where the word comes from. And knowing means that he sees everything. <clears throat> There's nothing that God don't know. And what really gets me, well, I'm, I'll get on, that's the next one. I'm, I'm going to stay there. i got to watch where I go with it because there's three sections into this. We break these down. you got uh, uh, 1 through 6, and then we're going 7 through 12, and then we'll take 13 through 18 or 19 through 24. Actually, there may be, yeah, there's there's three. 19 through 24. We're going to talk about the omniscience of God. That's what David's saying right there. He said, thou art, that verse verse 3, thou art, thou compassest my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. In other words, he David understands that he knows him completely. Every thought Every move, every action, even when he's asleep. David said, you know me. Even when I'm sleeping, I, I can't get away from you. Not that I want to get away from you. There's probably times that you would like to get away, as we would. Something comes out of our mouth, we wish God wasn't standing right there listening to what we said. Amen? But he is. He knows. He knows us. That's what I like about what David said. What they said about David is a man after God's own heart. Not that he is looking to know everything or be all powerful or anything. He knows that the love of God in his life is shined down on him. And David wants a big part of that, not just the small part. Thou compasseth my path. That... That right there in American Standard, in verse 3, Thou compassest my path, 
my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all of my ways. The American Standard said it searches out my path. In other words, God's looking at where you're going to. He knows where you're at. He knows what direction you're headed in, and He knows where you're going. He knows the, the beginning and the end of everything. But it says right there, Thou art acquainted with all of my ways. That compasseth my path. Compasseth means it's a metaphor for soldiers besieging their enemy. Now this is God. This is the way David thinks about God, knowing Him, and there's no way that he could get away from Him. God is, he says right here, is to surround and enclose on all sides. That's what that word compasseth means. And he said, Thou compasseth my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all of my ways. There is not a word, verse 4, there is not a, not a word in my tongue, but, O Lord, Thou knowest it altogether. I hope we get a better understanding, and, and it lifts us up about the God that we serve today. The God that's, that's over everything. The God that created everything. The God that has a plan for our life. The God that has the ultimate plan for all of history. All the way through the end book. You can go there in Revelation and you can see God's got it all figured out. It's already, he's already wrote it down. It's, already, it's a done deal in the, in the eyes of God. Because he sees from there, the beginning, all the way through. We're going to be with him forever. He sees past even when, uh, everything that goes on in heaven 10,000 years from now or 100,000 years from now. God knows. And we're going to spend eternity, by the way, learning more about this God and his omniscience, his omnipresence, and his omnipotence. That's all powerful. Omnipotent word. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. <clears throat> And where was I? Verse 4, there's not a word in my, on my tongue, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thy hand upon me. I like that. God's got his arm around you today. Amen. God knows. God's got his hand on your shoulder, son or daughter. He, he's got your back. That's what he's saying. You got your hand on me. You've laid your hand on me. You've blessed me. You're leading me through life. He even says here in a minute, you're holding my hand. That's the God we serve. It's good to know, especially in a world that we're in today. And by the way, what I was saying, there was so much evil men in the land that day. It's coming back. It's showing up again. Amen. We got to keep our eyes focused on the prize, and that's God himself and his plan, and trust him. That's the first thing that we have to do when we kneel at an altar or we do it somewhere. It don't matter where you get saved at. To believe the word, believe the gospel, believe that God sent his son to die for you on that rugged cross, died on that cross, was buried, rose again the third day, that's it. To get to that point right there, we got to trust him. I about lost my thought there, but I was getting carried away a little bit. Verse 6, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. That's the omniscience of God. He's also talking about God's knowledge. But here he's saying such knowledge is too wonderful for me. For me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Attain unto it. And by the way, we will never completely understand God, especially this side of eternity. Like I said a while ago, we're going to spend all eternity with God. It's going to be down here, as a matter of fact. Heaven's coming down, buddy. It's going to be right here on this planet. When God does away with all this sin-stained earth down here and burns it up and cleans it, and it's going to be a brand new city, the city of Jerusalem is coming down. On this earth, that's where we're going to dwell with God and all the other saints that were saved on credit, by the way, before Jesus came. All of those saints will be down here. And by the way, it's 1,500 miles wide, 
1,500 miles long. This is heaven. 1,500 miles high. That's how big the city of Jerusalem is going to be. That's huge. That's half the size of the United States. From here to Arizona, I think. Yeah. From here to Arizona, that's how big heaven's going to be. The city of Jerusalem. 1,500 miles high, there's going to be a lot of floors. You think you stayed in a condo on the base down there? Wait till we get to stay there. That's going to be nice. You can look out and see all the way around the world just about 1,500 miles high. You sure enough seen the curvature of the earth. Uh, I got off on heaven there for a second. So, Such knowledge. It's, there are you again. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. I'm going to have to get going here. Uh, I cannot attain unto it. <clears throat> Let's go on down. Omni, that was the omniscience of God. He knows everything. <clears throat> he knows the past, the present, and the future of all time. Verse 7, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Now he's talking about his omnipresence here. He's forever present. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Whether, whether shall I go from thy spirit or whether shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me. That's where I was saying he holds your hand. He's holding our hand right now. He's leading us. Come on, child. This is the way. Don't go that way. This, this is the way. Stay right beside me. Think, brother. Uh, Austin preached on walking beside Jesus. Don't get out ahead of him and don't get behind him. Stay right with him. Even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me, verse 10. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be a light unto me. It shall be a light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day, and the darkness and the light are both alike to thee. What's he saying there? He's saying all of the darkness, no matter all the evil, all the darkness of the whole world that's ever been, God is that light that pierces the darkness. As a matter of fact, when God shows up, the darkness has to flee. When Jesus went across the maniac of Gadara, and all that, that maniac over there was running around naked in the tombs, when Jesus showed up, there was legions of demons in this guy. First thing they said, ooh, we know who you are. Did you come to kill us? They said, don't kill us. That's what they said. Don't kill us. Send us into the swines. And he said, depart. They had to leave. The darkness has to go. And by the way, the demons knows who Jesus is, by the way. They know. They're the ones that failed. They, 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 they were up there with him. They had to go. As a matter of fact, when the darkness entered heaven, and we can't comprehend most of that, but when the darkness entered heaven, they had to go. They were cast out. Down to the earth, by the way, down here where we live at. Let's move on. <coughs> He's omnipresent is what he's saying. As surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be a light to me. Yea, the darkness hideth not, verse 12, from thee, but the night shineth as a day, and the darkness and the light are both alike to thee, for thou hast possessed my reins. Whoops, that's one too far. His omnipresence. <coughs> Anyway, he's there. You can't get away from God. Even if he wanted to get away, he couldn't get away. Even his, there's another, I think it's over in 62 over there, Psalm 62. I think this is talking about the refuge of God. Psalm 62, 7 and 8. It said, In God is my salvation and my glory. 
The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in him all at all times. Ye people, pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Amen. What is that refuge? I know I got a little ahead of myself, but security and a safe place. That's what David is saying there. If I'm asleep or if I'm awake, I'm sleeping under the stars, you're watching over me. You're there. I don't have to worry about you not being there for me. You're watching out for me. Even the darkness has to go. In other words, David knows God is his man, and he's right there beside him, and he can lay down and sleep at night and not have to worry about the trouble of the world, not have to worry about somebody sneaking up on him, God's got his back. God is omnipresent. Omnipresent means everywhere at the same time. You know how many people has been saved here the past few months? It's just over and over and over. Well, God's omnipresent. He can be saving somebody here, a hundred people here, and be saving individuals a hundred thousand people on the other side of the planet all at the same time in the same mind knows everything that that person's thinking them kneeling at the altar them drawing their heart to him every sing he could save 10 million people at once all over the planet all over the universe that's the omnipresence of god he is everywhere all the time at the same time it is widely and consistently encountered, widespread. That's the God we serve. You know, we worry about little stuff, what's going to happen over here. and have, if We put our trust in him, and that's what I was hoping when God gave me this, that this would encourage us and lift us up to understand the God that we serve and who he is and what he's done for us. He made a plan. He crucified his son on that cross and, and made a way for us. That's what he's done. That's what he's done for David too. And David has noticed and seen, even from the, the, him, the battle with the Goliath, David knows that God has been there his whole life. That's the omnipresence of God. That's the confidence that he has, and that's the confidence that we should have that we're sitting here and he's taking care of everything that we need in our life. Every, from the smallest thing to the greatest thing. God cares so much about the little bitty stuff that we don't want to bother him with. He cares about that because he knows you care about that. That's two of the attributes that I have of God. We know that God is our refuge. We know we should know that he is our king. Now we'll get over there in just a second. We'll have to speed it up a little bit here. He's our king. He's our refuge. And God is our stronghold. That's where the next one comes from. He's all powerful. Let me see where I got to. Where did I get to? Down to verse 13. Uh, actually, yeah, here we go. Verse 13 this is the, th the third section, the omnipotence of God. We've seen that God, that David knew that he knows everything. He knows everything about us. He knows all of our wants, our needs, our prayers, even stuff that don't matter. God cares about it. That's the omniscience of God, the all-knowing, the all-seeing God. The, um, the omnipresent God, he knows that he's there even when he's asleep. He don't have to worry about him not being there. And verse 13 through 18 is the omnipotent God. That means having unlimited power, able to do anything, sovereign, and all-powerful. There's nothing too strong that God can't take it out of the way. There's nothing that has any power over the one that we serve. Our little worries and frets and problems and stuff that we just, just overwhelms us, just give it to God. He knows that it's bothering you anyway. 
We just got to bring it to him. Sometimes, I want to tell you something, sometimes the smallest prayers, not rehearsed, just the smallest prayer, Lord, I need you to fix this. God likes it when you talk like that. He loves it when you're real with him. He wants to be real to us. He loves it when you're real to him and and you're true and it's coming from the heart. David was a man after God's own heart. He wanted to be like God. We want to be like, we are like God. We were created in his image. Now we don't have all of these different attributes of God and the characteristics of God, but we grow to be more like him every day. Amen. He's omnipotent, all power. Verse 13, and we'll read on down through 18. He said, Thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mom, in my mother's womb. That reins right there, for thou hast possessed my reins. David knows that God had so much power when he created him. That word reins right there means arteries, even vessels. Right down to every little thing that we can't see in our body, even the minute, the little cells. God created that. That's what he's saying. You know me inside and out, Lord. Upside down, inside out. You know everything about me. He's talking about how powerful the all the omniscience of God, the omnipresence of God, and the omnipotence of God, able to do anything. I've give this illustration over and over during some of the times that I preached. When you look out of these eyes, that soul, that spirit that lives inside of you, God created us in such a way even to have eyelashes to keep stuff out of our eyes so we could see. That hole that we look at, that is remarkable. If you get down and think about it, the way I, I, I want people to think about the, what David's talking about here, you know me personally, intimately, inside and out. Everything that you can tell, my heart beating, you can tell when I take a breath, you can tell when I blink my eye, and before a thought ever comes into my mind, you know it, Lord. That's what David's saying. <clears throat> For thou hast possessed my reins and hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Mine eye, thine eyes did see my substance yet being unperfect. Before he was ever created is what he's saying there. You knew me before I was even a cell. You knew me before I was ever conceived. You created. My substance was not hid from thee. I was made in secret, verse 15, and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. Before I was even ever thought of, you already knew me, Lord. You knew what I was going to be doing today. You knew what I was going to be doing 10 years ago. He knows it all. That's the omniscience of God. But he's, David is starting to praise God here for him knowing him personally. Jesus said, I'm closer than a friend. He is closer than a friend. He is our creator. And being our creator, all the power, all the knowledge, and all of his presence, all knowing. Let me see where I was at. Verse 17. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. What's he saying there? He's saying your love. That's the next attribute. It don't have it in this omni, omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent. It don't have it there. But he's saying, how precious are so are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sin. When I awake, I am still with thee. 
God said, I'll never let you go. Once God makes you a promise, it's going for eternity. He can't turn around. He can't lie. God is our refuge. I'm just going to go through a few of these and then <clears throat> so I can get wrap this thing up. The omniscience, the omnipresent, the omnipotent. That's all-knowing. Everywhere at the same time, omnipotent, having all power, able to do anything, sovereign, all-powerful. That's, that's the God that David is writing about here. It's too much for me. I can't attain unto it, it's what he says. <clears throat> Our refuge, that's what, that's what David is saying. You are refuge for me, Lord. You've covered all my needs. I don't have a want for anything. It says here, God is a refuge for us. That's Psalm 62 and 8. The godly man is exposed to sorrow and peril. Now, first of all, David, something had, before you can come to Christ, God has to stir you up. He's got to prepare your heart. Things are usually going, not that everybody gets saved without, by something going wrong, but something causes us to say, hey, Something's not right with this world, and something's tugging at my heart. It's a tug from another world. God makes his presence known. You're not getting out of this life without it being known. I heard a sermon today on who is Jesus. I think it was the blind man that went out, and they asked him what happened to you, and he said, I run into a man named Jesus. That's the blessed Son of God. Jesus asked Peter, he asked the disciples, he said, who do you say I am? What did Peter say? Thou art to Christ, the son of the living God. I mean, he just belched it out, the son of the living God. Amen, I had to, I had to get that in there. It says, the godly man is exposed to sorrow and peril. He participates that trouble, in that trouble which is common portion of all men, with all others, he is liable to sickness, adversity, bereavements, death, born to trouble, as sparks, sparks fly upward. But in addition to these, he is in enemy territory. And by the way, a Christian, we are pilgrims here just passing through. We are not home yet. That's why when you get saved, you, God opens your eyes. You start seeing the evil that's going on. You see the way that things are going. People don't love God. And they're not after God. God said, you'll seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. They're not doing that. They're going the other direction. As a matter of fact, they want to disturb. They want to disrupt the family and the home. If they can get that and everybody going that way, that's confusion. God's not the author of confusion, by the way. <clears throat> Amen to that. It says he's born to, born to trouble as the sparks fly upward, but in addition to these, he is in enemy territory. He is passing through a dreary wilderness, a wilderness of storms and dangers, where hostile hosts are the leagues against him. That's what David is doing here, and he's praising God in the middle of all of this because he has a rock that he can stand on. Strengthless and insufficient of himself, this is his comfort and safety. God is his refuge, a present help in times of trouble. They said, When is God his refuge to his people? In the period of temptation. I'm just going to read on through some of them. I'm not going to read all. In the period of temptation, that's when Satan comes in like a flood to sift us as wheat, when his fiery darts are directed and fearfully follows. Follows uh, his fearful follies against the people of God. These seasons are perilous and would be fearfully fatal. We're not God a refuge for us. First of all, when is God a refuge for his people? In the day of adversity, in the night of affliction, in the solemnities, solemnities of death, and let me read that, by the way, in the psalmities of death. When shall the spirit fly 
when chased out of her habitation and bold abode. Let me start over. When shall the spirit fly when chased out of her old habitation and abode? When she is no longer surrounded by the tabernacle of, God, of, of the body, then the bosom of God is the refuge. The house not made with hands is the abode. The heavenly mansion, the dwelling forever and ever, we inquire. That's what we're looking forward to, but we still got to live down here. And that's what David's saying right here. Even though I'm going through all of this trouble, Lord, you're here. You've been here. And I can't turn away from you. You can run from God, but it tells you right there he's omnipresent. It don't matter where you run to. You're running from yourself. You can tuck tail and run. And you can forget about God. But he will bring. There's, there's a verse in the Bible that says, I will bring the remembrance of the words that I've told you. He won't let you go. If you're a child of God, you, you can run all you want. You ain't getting away. You, you're it. He's got you. Thank the Lord for that. Because I've run from him before. I've got away from God. And he loved me so much. And that's the last attribute I wanted to talk about here. He loved me so much he won't let go. And he wouldn't let David go. That's what David is saying there too. I tried to get away. He's not really saying that, but I can feel him saying it. I tried to get away, but you won't let me go. I want to go over here, but you won't let me go. But there was a time in David's life when the kings were supposed to be at war and David was asleep in the middle of the day when he should have been at war doing what he was supposed to have been doing, on the job, whatever he was supposed to have been doing. And he got up and walked out on his balcony and looked down at a woman. And the rest is history. The sword never left his house because of what he did. <clears throat> and I'm sure most of you know the story with Bathsheba. <clears throat> Going further. He is a refuge ever near. He's always accessible, unchangeable, and eternal. A refuge to his people in all countries and ages and gener generations. A refuge now and always and generations. A refuge that never fails. A refuge in time and through all eternity. If God be such a refuge, then we infer the absolute security of his people. I'm going to leave that right there. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That is the message of salvation all wrapped up in one. I think Brother James said that Sunday. That's the most powerful verse in the Bible. There are some more verses. Romans 11, 30, 11 and 33 said, O oh, the depths and the riches both of wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Romans well, verse 36 says, For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be the glory forever. Amen. That's the God we serve. It's all created for him, to him, through him, and because of him, by the way. All believers, this, is, this should be our response. I hope I've brought it across the way that God gave it to me when I read this and I could just see David. He was just full of joy that he didn't have to worry no matter what was coming after him, what he was going into. He didn't know what was going to happen. He had joy in the middle of the night, in, in the midnight, sleeping out in the darkness, out in the desert, sleeping out there. He said, I can't get away from it even when I'm sleeping. Even in my dreams, I don't have to worry. You're there. It says, all believers who come to understand the attributes of God find them a great source of comfort and a great prompting 
to obey him. Once we realize who God is and what he's done for us and what he keeps doing for us and what he'll never stop doing for us, it ought to make us give him praise. Amen. We ought to be thankful that we have a God. We don't serve a dead God. We don't serve some totem pole somewhere. We serve a living Christ today, a living God. He gives us stability. 2 Timothy 4 and 18. I'm going to read a few verses and then we'll close. I may not read them all. 2 Timothy, let me get this out of the way, 4 and 18. It says, And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be the glory forever. Amen. That's the God that we serve. Ephesians 3 and 20. And it says, Now unto him who is able to do and exceedingly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. There is his omnipotence working in and through us. Unto him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all the ages, world without end. That's verse 21. I didn't even have that one down. John 10. 29 and 30. Now let's try to hurry up through this. I want to I want to read you something. John 10, 29 and 30. Next page. It sort of gives us some stability. He said, My father, which gave them me, is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. I and my Father are one. And Jesus is God, by the way. He said he was. He said, before Abraham was, I am. He was in heaven with God. When God said, let's create man in our image, we know who that was. If you don't, that's Jesus Christ himself, the Messiah, the one that come to save his people. Romans 8 and 28. I'm not here, but. <clears throat> I'm going to write all these down, but I don't have a list. Romans 8 and 28. Actually, it's 8 and 28 and 31. Romans 8, 28 said, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. Verse 33 said, What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? 35 through 39, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm sure everybody knows the biggest, the greatest attribute of God is His love. That's that agape love. That's that sacrificial love. That's that love that someone would lay down their life for you. As a matter of fact, that's exactly what he did. He laid down his life for us, and he'd do it again. And Brother James says it all the time. I say it too. If he's the only one left, he did it all 
for you. It transcends circumstances. That's the sacrificial love. Let me read you. That's his greatest attribute. I'm going to close with this, this song. I'm not going to sing, by the way. I'm going to close with this song, The Love of God. I, I heard, uh, I love it, the Gaithers sing that song, those guys, and it just, oh my goodness. But the original text of that song was written in an asylum, asylum, hold on, a sane asylum, a, a tell me, that's me, in a, in a, a sane asylum. Insane asylum is what it was. On the walls of an insane asylum. Get me tongue tied here. Yeah, it was written on the wall. That's where that song came from. And they got it in 1050. 1050 is where that song came from. That poem was written on that wall. <clears throat> Let me just read it. It says, It turns out, however, that the lines from the asylum wall came from a long poem written in Aramaic in the 11th century by a Jewish rabbi in Worms, Germany. The poem is called, uh, I didn't do the word study on this, Hadamut, H-A-D-A-M-U-T, Hadamut. That's the, the name of the poem. But if you go read the, the words that they had then, it's almost, it's too much poetry for my thinking. I mean, I can get it, I have to break it down and, but I just want to read. I just want to read the love of God in layman terms. The song that they come up with, the unmeasurable, the greatest attribute that God has is His love for us and His people. It says, "The love of God is greater than a tongue or pen could tell. It reaches to the highest star beyond." the depths of hell. If we could fill the seas with ink and make the pages of sky, to write the love of God above would drain the oceans dry. The sons of Adam, lost in sin, by God's great love were found when on the cross he fought for us to win us glorious crown. Beyond the highest heights, beneath the depths of sea, nothing on earth can contain his endless love for me. Amen. That's, I love that song when the gates are singing. I say, don't sound like that. I, I, I can hear him. The love of God is greater more than gold or silver ever could afford. It reaches past the highest stars. There'll always be the love of God. Amen. I hate to kill y'all with that, but I just had to do it. That's, I was singing that all day long. Amen. The love of God. That was kind of a uh, Bible study slash teaching slash lesson slash I'm thankful. The God who He is tonight. I, I'm thankful for this church. Thankful for what He's done in this church and the, the people that's been saved, lives that's been changed. I think He's touched every family in here. I know He's He's been working a work in my family. I'll tell you that much. There's three or four come forward, and it's just still going on. Even extended family. My granddaughter, my daughter, my other daughter. She was she was driving down here the other day. Still waiting on that to happen. But Chris, all his family. I, I don't know anybody here that hasn't been touched by the love of God in this church. Amen. I know uh, I'm a little bit over, but anybody?